All views and opinions expressed in this podcast may lead to learning. All information provided is for educational and developmental purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for a growth mindset. Before taking action, please consult your motivation. This is the Teacher Talking Time Podcast. But there are lots of other tools available as well that can be useful. The tools that are not specifically for grammar, but that could be useful. The use of corpora, all sorts of tools that are available would be ridiculous to ignore them. So really our role as teachers has, is to be, how can we train students to become better and more critical users of those tools? Um, Grammarly doesn't always give correct advice. So we need to make them aware of that. And so we have time spent in class looking at what feedback is given, what feedback is not given because they don't pick up on all the errors, whether it's correct or not, but they need to be critical consumers of those tools. And I think that's an important role of writing teachers. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Teacher Talking Time podcast brought to you by Learn Your English. To those of you who are new listening to this podcast for the first time, the main aim of our podcast is to really deconstruct language teaching, to bridge the gap between research and personal practice. Each episode is dedicated to our vision of education, continuous growth that is accessible, affordable, and appropriate to your context. Andrew, we also have a membership, don't we? We absolutely do our Learn Your English Teacher Development Membership, where you can join a community of curious teachers and educators who want to achieve more without having to plan and teach more. Leo, you like to say, teach more mindfully, right? That's right. And that's what we try to do with our membership. We try to provide content, mentoring, courses, and more importantly, a community, a community of practice to help teachers plan less so they can actually have time to develop more. And what we focus on, Andrew, mindful and meaningful teaching, better thinking, continuous learning, developing a healthy mind, purposeful creativity, mental tools for thought, and humanistic education. Andrew, if somebody wants to become a member, what do they have to do? Oh, so simple. Just go to courses.learnyourenglish.net and become a member right there. You'll have access to all of our materials, not only for this month, but for all the months that you missed in the past. If you want more information, check out learnyourenglish.net slash memberships. We are thrilled to announce our partnership with Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada for this podcast series on corrective feedback. A big thank you to Dr. Eva Karchava and her MA class to produce this interview series, which we know will be a fantastic analysis of corrective feedback and its role in language learning and teaching. This series has eight episodes focusing on aspects of corrective feedback. Corrective feedback is a crucial area of second language acquisition and there has been a lot of research done recently to shed light on the role it plays in student learning. Seven of the interviews in this series were conducted by students in Dr. Karchava's MA class as means of assessment to do two primary things. Number one, to connect researchers to their audience, and number two, to have her students have a greater level of understanding and investment in the research they were reading. That's right, Leo, and we're excited to provide an outlet for this project and to give not only new voices an opportunity to be heard, but to allow for new podcasting experiences for many. If you or your institution is interested in producing a mini-series, either as a means of assessment or otherwise, please reach out to us at info at learnyourenglish.com. Dr. Naomi Storch is an Associate Professor of Applied Linguistics at the University of Melbourne in Australia. 
She teaches a range of ESL and applied linguistics subjects and convenes the ESL program. She is world-renowned for her work on second language acquisition, collaborative writing, and academic writing. She has over 100 scholarly works published on these topics, including her 2013 book, Collaborative Writing in L2 Classrooms, and a 2016 co-authored book called Written Corrective Feedback in L2 Development. This interview was conducted by Zara Sizi and Shruk abdel With that said, let's get on with the show. We would like to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to chat with us about your research regarding corrective feedback. Um, for your for our listeners out there, could you please tell a little about yourself, like your early career in teaching, and also what sparked your interest in corrective feedback? Okay, so. Um... I've been, I mean, I didn't set out to be an English teacher. <laughs> My undergraduate degree was actually in economics. Um, and I started teaching um, a group of migrant women in a college. We have, we have colleges in Australia, like pre-university colleges. And um, I think they thought because I sort of, They were preparing for office work and they thought because I have an economics degree, I should be able to prepare them for office work, which was, of course, a bit unrealistic because I'd never worked in an office before. But anyway, I became really interested in teaching them English and went to uh, do further study, eventually uh, graduate diplomas and um, master's and a PhD. So it was really serendipity rather than a plan to become an English teacher. Um, I've always been interested in writing because I know writing is difficult. Uh, English is not my first language either. I came to Australia at the age of 13, so, and in those days there were no ESL programs. Um, I was the only migrant student in the class, and so I really had to struggle. So I feel a lot of sympathy and, and I have a lot of understanding of what uh, second language learners go through when they learn a language and particularly language at high levels. In terms of feedback, I mean, it's something that teachers do all the time and we know that we spend an inordinate amount of time providing feedback to our students. We know that students want feedback, but the question is, does it make a difference? So, you know, all the hours that we spend on providing feedback, is that the most effective way of spending our time and that sort of became something that I began to investigate with many of the topics that I investigate really arise from something that I reflect upon in my teaching so it's the same with students progress over time do they improve over time in early studies on uh, whether students improve um, and even collaborative writing when you know all those topics came out of teaching practice. So corrective feedback is certainly one of those. All right. Um, I, I get to, uh, to ask the next question. And it's okay. actually related to your recent research. And so in, in your recent research, there's a quote that really makes me think as a teacher myself and how this would apply to, to my own, uh, how I would how I would best apply this into my teaching. So you say here, in order to fully understand how and why learners respond to feedback, it's also important to consider how individual factors interact with elements in the immediate instructional context, as well as the broader social context in which the feedback activity takes place. So I was wondering if you could expand on that for our listeners and particularly to the teachers that are listening out there. Yeah, sure. I mean, again, it, research on whether feedback is effective or not keeps on coming back with inconclusive or mixed results. So we really need to look at, you know, we give feedback, but if students do nothing with that feedback, then it makes no difference. We need to have a look at how students engage with that feedback. And when we look at students' engagement with feedback, we realise there's lots of factors that are impacting on their engagement. And those, some of those factors are personal factors, individual factors, their goals, 
whether they have time, whether their accuracy is important for them or not. But then there are the broader factors. So if you look at research by IC Lee, for example, early research, which looks at the culture. She was looking at uh, the situation in Hong Kong and the pressure on teachers and students from their families. So if we're looking at younger learners, teachers involved with younger learners, that becomes important. You know, what are the family's expectations? Um, what are the school's expectations? Um, what are the broader, you know, is it an exam culture where you have to sort of get your grammatical accuracy perfect in order to get into high institutions? All those things impact on learners' behaviour and we can't ignore them. And I think that's one of my concerns with recent research, particularly research that looks at learners' engagement and seems to treat the activity of feedback as if it happens in a vacuum. So we don't sort of consider the broader context. We only look at learners' engagement, which I think is important. You know, they, they look at behavioral, cognitive, affective engagement, great. But we need to go beyond the individual to look at what happens in the broader context and broader society, um, to look at attitudes to teachers. You know, if teachers are not respected in certain societies, students are not going to pay attention to the feedback they receive. So, you know, this is important. In a classroom situation, for example, the relationship the student had with the teacher. Again, there is a small number of studies which have looked at that, and I think there was one that was undertaken in Korea, if I remember correctly, which showed that the student who felt that he knew more than the teacher, um, he wasn't going to take any notice of the teacher's feedback because he had, a, you know, an, a uh, two months of, oh, I don't know how many, months of an extended of a study abroad and he felt that he was more of an expert than the teacher which wasn't true but these are important considerations so sorry what just to follow up on that what kind of advice would you give a teacher in that situation um, look there's lots of advice <laughs> <can be> given. <laughs> um, I think we need to um have an honest discussion with the students, I suppose. And for, I'm talking about adult students, and I'm not sure if it would work in a classroom situation. But with adult students, I, I can talk about later, I have an annotation system where I encourage them to take charge of what kind of feedback would they like to, what are they mostly concerned about. But even with younger learners, you can sort of um, look at that and consider whether um, whether accuracy is important for them, how much feedback they want to receive. Um, I think these are important conversations and we cannot always, uh, they cannot always take place because in certain places, if you are teaching um, in a context where you have to give feedback because the institution requires you to, then, you know, that's hard. Um, and a particular type of feedback. But I think where there is that um, opportunity, I think it's important to take for that discussion to take place. Um, but clearly a relationship with between students and teachers is an important one. Um, and we want to encourage students not to feel intimidated by teachers so that can approach teachers if they don't understand feedback. Because again, we have research showing students don't understand feedback and they just follow it and that's not going to lead to any learning either. And what about the number of feedbacks? So when we assume our learners to know less, do we uh, give them more feedback or doesn't necessarily <laughs> look like that? Okay, again, one of the danger we have as teachers, and it includes me, is that we can overwhelm students with feedback, <laughs> okay? So, you know, it's one of the things that I um, highly recommend to teachers is to um, retrospectively look at the feedback they give their students. And I do that on occasion and giving feedback electronically is really good because then I start deleting some of my feedback because I think you're overwhelming the students. So, and that, you know, even with my PhD students, I don't want them to become overwhelmed by the kind of amount of feedback. I mean, that could be really discouraging. Uh, you're smiling, you're all <laughs> either given too much or received too much feedback. <laughs> um, 
In terms of lower learners, again, I think given that there are lower proficiency, the advice from the literature is not to overwhelm them, to give them targeted feedback, perhaps on structures that you covered in class, and then build up the amount of feedback structure that you, uh, the number of structures you give feedback on. But I think it's particularly important with lower proficiency learners not to give too much feedback on every single error. I think it's counterproductive. And we can't help it as teachers. We often feel that we have to give feedback on every single error. And again, I'm as guilty as anyone else. I tend to sort of overdo it. But I try, um, and again, I don't work with low proficiency learners. I try not to give too much feedback now. Um, and, and you also have to tell the students, again, in advance, in that early conversation that you're going to be giving targeted feedback so they're not lulled into this false sense of security that if they don't get feedback, you know, it's, it's accurate. So, again, it's important to include that point in the early conversations about feedback. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. You know, quality professional development is such an important part of the teaching industry, but it's surprisingly hard to come by. That's why I was so pleased to come across Learn Your English, a company providing online teacher education courses with a fresh perspective. My name is Erin, and I'm an English language teacher. After a decade in the classroom, I found myself teaching the same things in the same way. My learning seemed to have plateaued. I wanted to take charge of my learning, and I really like how the online Learn Your English courses don't prescribe anything. They motivate me to reflect on my teaching and propose tactics and ideas I hadn't considered. If you're a language teacher wanting to learn inside your busy schedule, I highly recommend their online courses on Thinkific. Head on over to lyenetwork.thinkific.com. That's lyenetwork.thinkific.com. Take control of your education. You won't regret it. Hi everybody, my name is Kimberly and I'm from Malawi. This is Teacher Talking Time to Learn Your English Podcast. I have a, a question related. I'm going to take you a little bit off topic here. Well, not really. We're still talking about feedback, but in terms of collaborative writing versus cooperative writing. So can you explain to our uh, listeners what the difference is between that? And in terms of uh, feedback and uptake, um, which do you see or which in your research has shown uh, has better uptake for our students? So I'll split it to, um, and I think here we're talking about peer feedback rather than teacher feedback. Okay. Yes. So, yeah, no, that's an interesting question. So collaboration, as I define it, uh, or I originally defined it, uh, means that there's a co-ownership involvement in all parts of the writing. So basically we get two or three, maybe four, I tend to use pairs or, or try it the most, where they jointly construct, co-construct a text. They feel ownership of the entire text. They involve no decision-making. And because of that sense of ownership, they feel that they can make suggestions about how best to express the ideas because these are joint ideas, and that's collaboration. Cooperation um, means, for example, that basically we there is some sort of a division of labour. So we often have that in group work. So we give students an assignment, a group assignment, I'll do the research because I'm the, na- the non-native speaker and you're the native speaker. You have very good writing. You do the writer, okay? I'm not going to look at the writing because I don't feel able to sort of contribute or I feel intimidated by your, le- your proficiency um, or if I think that you're more proficient than me so I won't contribute. Or we separate the bits. So I write the introduction, you write the body and somebody else writes the conclusion. That's cooperation. Or we have what we see more now, we discuss the topic together, we uh, write individually, and then we swap papers for peer feedback. That's some sort of cooperative uh, approach to writing as well. It's very different from collaboration, as I said, where we jointly co-construct a text. Now, how does it impact on feedback? 
But if we jointly write the text and we feel ownership, then as I said before, I feel the right, I have feel that I have the right to provide feedback on the writing because it's our own our writing. But if it's cooperative writing, then as I said, you've written your piece, your bit, and I write my bit. And I may make suggestions, but I don't have the same sense of ownership because it's your contribution. And if we divide the roles all together and I do the research and you do the writing, it's unlikely, again, that I, again, it's not the same sense of ownership. And this is what I've written about in the chapter that's coming out in a book soon. It's that sense of ownership which is really important. I think it's really important um, in collaborative writing. And that's why um, if we look at peer feedback, we often see that students are reluctant to take it up or students are reluctant to give feedback to each other. Um, it's not their text, you know. They don't own it. They thought of, you know, they give feedback, but it's not their text. That's very different from collaborative writing where it's their text. The interesting uh, thing that's happening is the use of the collaborative writing platforms like Google Docs and Wikis, and here we see, again, a reluctance to make amendments to other people's contribution. Obviously, that mode of communication has an impact on the sense of ownership. So it's your posting and I feel reluctant. I almost have to ask you permission if you allow me to correct it. Um, and we see more evidence of that in online collaboration compared to face-to-face -face collaboration, which fits in with the theory that has informed my research, which is uh, sociocultural theory, and talks about the impact of the tools that we use on our activity. But, yes, that's the big difference between collaboration and cooperation and has a flow-on effect on engagement, provision of peer feedback and take-up of peer feedback as well. Yeah, speaking of this reluctance of the learners, uh, based on your research, the learner's reluctance to engage in collaborative writing and the peer feedback may abet with the advent of the collaborative computer-mediated task. Uh, so I think that is actually good news for teachers and learners who are interested in second language collaborative writing nowadays that online learning and teaching has become the only choice for many learners and teachers. Uh, now, my question is that how optimistic are you overseeing the future of collaborative writing in distance education? Um, when I first started looking at collaborative writing, we didn't use online collaboration. And the interest, I think, that um, we've witnessed over the years in collaboration, collaborative writing, has, it's definitely been spurred on by technology, by these platforms. So I think um, they certainly facilitate collaborative writing. And so um, they've really, you know, been a godsend in a sense for us during the time of the pandemic. Um, so, yes, I see much more collaborative writing in the classes and also in the workplace perhaps um, facilitated by these platforms. And if we want to prepare students for workplace writing, then really we need to include collaborative writing in classes. At the same time, I always say not all writing should be collaborative, okay? So it doesn't mean that all writing should be collaborative or all project, all assignments should be group assignments. So I do make that point very clearly. Um, I don't think, and, and students are reluctant to participate in collaborative writing for a number of reasons, both individual and contextual, as is the case with feedback. There could be individual because they take pride in their writing and collaborative writing doesn't allow them. They feel Marks are very important for them and they feel that, you know, writing with somebody else impacts on them. Contextual factors, they may be in a very competitive education system where high marks are really important. They're not used to writing collaboratively. All the schooling was done on an individual basis. So there's lots of reasons why students are reluctant to engage in collaborative writing. 
So I think it's again um, in the recommendation I me in the recommendation I make about youth in collaborative writing, the importance of having a discussion, allowing students to choose whether to collaborate or not, and having collaborative writing activities on more than one occasion so that they could perhaps observe how other people collaborate and say, well, maybe I'm willing to give it a go, it looks like a fun activity, or maybe on this particular assignment I'd like to collaborate. So I think, there's a cho- I think there should be a choice involved um, in collaborative writing activities. And to follow up, do you see a big difference between web-mediated tasks in collaborative writing classes and entirely web-based classes? I haven't uh, investigated the it- I mean, I can see the the impact of web-based classes on students' interactions. I mean, there's no doubt it's very different to -to face-to-face interaction. Whether web-mediated classes, uh, if they complement face-to-face, then they would be ideal. There would be some face-to-face collaboration. But if it's entirely web-based classes, then I don't know. As I said, I haven't investigated the impact of that being the norm on on collaborative writing. Um, It will have an impact, the same as it will have an impact on individual writing. Uh, We already, I've already, for example, changed the way I test students' writing in one of my classes, whereas in the past I'd make sure that they don't have their computers Um, open to platforms which provide um, corrections like um, spell checkers or grammar checkers. But now, you know, it's a lot harder to control and I've changed my mind. I think, well, I need to let them have access to those and see how effectively they use it. That's a more important skill. I was going to ask, yeah, that was my one question about, you know, Grammarly and these tools that are really useful. And I think we have, I have the opinion, you know, the tool isn't good or bad by itself. It's, it's how we use it. And as teachers, how we teach our students to and when to use it. So um, what's your opinion? I guess Grammarly and Spellcheck and these types of things that are unavoidable in an online world, but they, they have benefits if they're used correctly, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think in one of the classes, the course that I teach now, I started teaching this three years ago and designed and now teach it. And it's called advanced self-editing. And what I teach students is also how to use a range of online tools in helping them to become better self-editors. And that starts off with Grammarly and looking at the difference between the free version and the paid version. But there are lots of other tools available as well that can be useful. Um, And, you know, Immersive Reader, for example, tools that are not specifically for grammar, but that could be useful. Um, the use of corpora, all sorts of tools that are available would be ridiculous to ignore them. So really our role as teachers has, is to be how can we um, train students to become better and more critical users of those tools. Um, Grammarly doesn't always give correct advice, so um, we need to make them aware of that and so we have time time spending class, looking at what feedback is given, what feedback is not given because they don't pick up on all the errors, whether it's correct or not, but they need to be critical consumers of those tools. And I think that's an important role of writing teachers. So, yes, definitely. Um, I was also referring to testing situation where the said in the past we tend to be very obsessed with test security and, you know, we don't want students to copy or but I think we need to change how we conduct tests as well, language tests as well. Oh, that's a good, can you, can't leave that hanging. Do you have any suggestions, any examples you can, you can put forth for how we need to change testing? Well, as I said, I, um, I let students use, uh, in the, they do have a test in, my, in this particular subject. Um, and so I observe them. So I, I want to make sure they're doing the writing, not someone else. So they have to have their cameras on. It, to be um, effective use, I mean, if I give them a limited time in which to complete the test, it will also mean that they can't spend hours and hours on using those tools. They have to be selective. They have to be effective users. So 
classroom practice, preparing them for this effective use of tools is important, but in terms of tests is to take that into consideration um, and allow it. But, you know, this is new. This is relatively new. So <laughs> we're just starting. <laughs> In the trial stage, right? That's right. <laughs> All right. Um, yes. I just have something really quickly. Sorry, Andrew, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no. Go. Okay. Just something really quickly, um, because I am a writing teacher, and I've been a writing teacher for a long time, and um, it really it hit me when you said that we have to teach our students to be critical consumers. And that becomes very difficult when our, a lot of our students think that this technology that they're relying on is, by God, the best thing, you know, that they've ever discovered. I just have to pay a fee and then I'm getting all this editing. And I struggle with that because they come to my class and they're challenging me with Grammarly. So, and I find it very, very difficult because they're very stubborn. Um, to get them to understand that Grammarly or whatever online tool, and I'm not attacking Grammarly per se, but all of these online tools need a critical eye and you need to understand the language to be able to critique it. So it's very difficult to teach them to criticize when they don't actually have the tools to criticize. So how do I deal with that as an instructor? Because that's a problem that I face in class a lot. Okay. Especially with but, the upper levels. So that said, my students are also advanced. And if I give them a I use a model text and ask them to first um, provide feedback, you know, like an editing activity, and they do it on their own first. Or they can do it in pairs. And then they use the same original text and use Grammarly. And they can then see the kind of feedback that Grammarly gives and the kind of feedback that they tend to give to see, first of all, that Grammarly um, gives feedback only not on everything, that it may give incorrect feedback, particularly in terms of spelling and spelling variations. Um, and with advanced learners, you can do that. You can say, you know, at the same, you know, with usage, it's important to, to take into consideration so that they, you know, they sort of see on, you know, on their own rather than me telling them that Grammarly doesn't always give all the answers, nor does it give the correct answers. It gives a large number of corrections that are correct, but often they are fairly superficial too. So that's important to show them as well, that especially the free version of Grammarly tends to give fairly, you know, feedback on fairly superficial errors. So. Uh, spelling and that's the same with all uh, of those grammar you know even more sophisticated one like criterion you know I've got a student who has finished a PhD on the kind of feedback that criterion gives and again I mean it gives fairly accurate feedback more accurate feedback perhaps than other platforms but it's not always accurate it gives false and it gives false positives um, so it corrects the things that are right. So I think exposing them, you know, giving them that experience rather than trying to persuade them is probably a good way of going about it. Lovely. Yeah. Choices, right? Giving them or giving them the, the autonomy to to make choices and, and not necessarily right or wrong, but why did you choose to do this versus why did you choose to do that? And giving them, you know, and, and exposing them to a range of tools and some tools work better than others, particular students. So as I said, one of my students last year, for example, found Immersive Reader as the most useful tool he's ever been exposed to. And he keeps on writing me email, thanking me to alerting him to that tool more than Grammarly or anything else. So <laughs> something worked better than others. <laughs> I think I guess I lied. I have more than one question. This is my last one, though. I promise. <laughs> um, and that's, I mean, for me, a lot a big benefit of to go back to the collaborative writing discussion. The big benefit of, of collaboration is negotiation of meaning, right, between students. And in, in this case, it's between the student and and the tool and whatever the tool is. But I think that's for me an important point that we still need that negotiation. We don't want to say 
what's my mistake, what's my error, and let's just fix it and not contemplate or not reflect on why I made that mistake. And do you think, because I was thinking about this, maybe I'm completely way off base, but in terms of corrective feedback and collaborative writing, if students are doing it in pairs, they're kind of some simultaneous tasks in that sense, because they're building a text and presumably they would be negotiating the meaning, which in a way is they're kind of providing feedback to each other on the spot in the process of doing that. So there's a lot of layers to that kind of activity, right? Yeah. So again, I don't want to sort of promote my own writing, but... Um, <laughs> no, no, please. But basically, if you look at collaborative writing and the advantage of collaborative writing, is that that peer feedback is available on the spot. So as we are, um, you know, if I don't know how to express an idea, I've got an immediate um, source of information um, that, uh, that, you know, enables me to work out that problems. If you think about other situations like t- teacher feedback or even peer feedback, that comes after the event, after I've finished writing. Um, and I may have forgotten that I had that as an issue. Um, so it's great that it's available, apart from the fact of ownership and willingness to provide feedback, um, it's also the immediacy of the feedback in a collaborative writing activity, and I think that's great. Now, that also um, that happens during the negotiations that you know over ideas on how best to express ideas. So it's sort of a, an appropriate context for that kind of negotiation. Um, the only issue, one of the issues that I have with you sort of mentioned initially the tools, um, it's not the same kind of collaboration with tools because often it can, you know, if the tool keeps on, you know, putting squiggles under your words or phrases as you're writing, it could be distractive. So we have to make sure the students are not distracted by that availability of feedback, immediate feedback by the tool. It's different. Um, I think in collaborative writing, it occurs almost organically because we're struggling how to produce a word. But when the tool provides you the feedback, you know, it occurs all the time. And so it's it's a bit different. And I think, I don't think that much negotiation that usually happens. You were saying before about students, you see it as an expert, they don't negotiate with that expert, that tool. Um, They're more likely to negotiate with peers. because, you know, they're of similar level. And also the explanation they give each other in peer feedback. And again, unlike teacher feedback, they're more likely to understand it because they, they don't use sort of the advanced meta language that a teacher or a tool may use. Um, they'll use simple language or whatever, but they'll explain it to each other um, much better, I think, than a tool or a, sometimes a teacher. Not always, but sometimes a teacher. On that note, does anybody, would anybody else like to ask any questions or shall I wrap it up and thank you very much for your time? That's okay. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank you on behalf of all the listeners and all of us here at Learn Your English. Thank um, you. Enjoyed it? Yeah. You've been listening to Teacher Talking Time, brought to you by Learn Your English. Ready to take control of your education? You're in the right place. Teaching, professional development, learning. Expand your world with Learn Your English.